in regards to chapter, you get down to verse 8 and you see that there is absolutely no question as to who the Lord of the Sabbath is, who determines these things, and who finally writes the understanding of who God himself uh, makes clear is the ultimate demonstrator, not only of the authority of the law, but really the priority of the law. <clears throat> so, now I'm going to look at verses 9 through 14. Today And uh, we're going to look at it, I'm hoping to do the entire thing today, but I want to look at its other cross-references. And you'll find them across Scripture in a couple different areas. Uh, you'll find them first in Mark 3, uh, 1 through 6, and you'll also see it in Luke chapter 6. So, uh, let's see. I'm going to read first the text in Matthew, and then we'll go over to Mark. So, in Matthew, starting in verse 9, he went from there and entered their synagogue. And a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him? And he said to them, which, of my, uh, which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is this man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Now that's key. Bear that in mind. The lawful thing specifically is a generic to be doing good term. We're going to come back to that. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand, and the, man, uh, and the man stretched it out, and it was restored, healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him on how to destroy him. Okay, so here in the text of Matthew, we can draw a couple assumptions right out of the gate. First, uh, the per there is a personal pronoun in verse 9. He went and entered their synagogue, plural, uh, third person. And so this tells us that he went specifically to their synagogue, who is there. They are the ones that have confronted him in verses 1 through 8 about the showbread and the eating of the grain and such like. So he's going to these Pharisees, and he's directly confronting them in their synagogue, <laughs> these same people here. Uh, he, this is uh, interesting because this also, and this is going to play into verse 14, this is the first time that Jesus openly returns uh, offense against these guys, if you will. He's been confronted before. They have uh, confronted him before, and they've dealt, and he's answered them, but this is the first time Jesus goes to them and directly confronts them on their unrighteousness and their sinfulness and their lack of repentance. And he goes specifically to these particular Pharisees, the ones that were trying to catch him on a technicality in verses 1 through 8, and goes to that synagogue. <laughs> now, we don't know what synagogue that was, we know synagogue, uh, this is not the temple, this is not Jerusalem, this is not the center of uh, religious Jewish life and thought yet. A local synagogue was, uh, it was much like a, a church, a small church today, right? It was a house. Uh, there would be a couple rabbis or Pharisees that would be instated there, and it was their job to pretty much just kind of administrate the law and uh, to read it, to scribe it. Scribes would be here, lawyers would be here, and on every Sabbath day, the whole town comes together, and they hear the reading of the law, and they may sing a couple psalms, and then they uh, have uh, one or two of the men will get up and stand and read and maybe explain a little bit of the law, especially if you're qualified to do so, like a rabbi or something like that. And so um, this is usually what's going on here. And so we're going to look also at another section. Let's turn over to the Mark reference. Or no, I'm sorry. Let's go to the Luke reference next. I'm sorry. Luke 6. This is Luke's cross-reference of the same story. The same event. Luke records the same details, and he says in Luke 6.6, 6, on another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. Okay, so this tells us something. So apparently, this whole thing happens with the grain. He goes to the synagogue, this specific synagogue, where these particular opponents of his are uh, maintaining, or they are, they, their home synagogue, whatever term you want to use there. And he was teaching there which was his custom, as we know, right? He would go to synagogues, he'd go through village to village, and he'd teach, and here he is teaching in this specific synagogue. And there was a man whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so they might find a reason to accuse him. This is interesting. So Luke tells us, or, or excuse me, Matthew says they just confronted him directly, and they said, are you allowed to heal on the Sabbath? Tell us yes or no. Uh, and Luke, apparently, they're watching and waiting, kind of like wolves, they're... They're waiting for him to slip and make a mistake so they can catch him on it immediately. You can see the, just the general antagonism, and uh, it's obvious, it could be pretty clear here to see that both of these would be very much a part of their strategy, <laughs> right? You could be confronting Jesus, or the second that he considers healing somebody, you can run out there and catch him in the act. If you've ever been arguing with somebody, or you've been in a debate with somebody, and you can 
almost sense that they're waiting for you to make a mistake, right? They're going to jump on you the second that they know that you've made some error. They're not even interested in, in the truth or the facts or anything like that. They're just waiting to catch you out. That's almost the kind of sense that both Luke and Matthew are pretending. They're lying in wait, and they're also just confronting him and openly asking him while he's trying to teach. But he knew their thoughts, and he said to the man with the withered hand, Come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. So another uh, setting and background and from piece of information we can probably draw from this is, for the most part, synagogues would be pretty uh, community-driven. And what I mean by that is everybody largely would know everybody nearby. This, the, most villages that you find or ruins that you dig up or we've dug up in ancient Israel maybe had a couple hundred people in them in the village, max, on, on a good day. And so uh, Capernaum is estimated to be about 1,500 That'd be like a mid-sized town. Um, Bethlehem was somewhere uh, around uh, two to 3,000. And then Jerusalem, the great Jerusalem is 10,000 people, max, uh, 10 to 12,000 people. So for reference, the population of Lincolnton is about 10 to 12,000 people, about 11,000. So uh, much smaller communities in this time, especially you go out in the boondocks where the villages and towns are. It would not be uncommon for a man with a withered hand to be a parent in the synagogue, to be here, and to be fairly well-known, is my point. That uh, people would know this is a man who comes to the synagogue, and this is a man who has a withered hand problem. He's got some kind of paralysis issue, which we're going to get to in just a minute. It would be impossible to fake this, is my point. It would be impossible for someone to say, Jesus created a stranger and created some kind of... uh, a uh, miraculous illusion of sorts as a magician would uh, by putting a plant in the audience. This would be someone who was well-known, or at least known and acquainted in a local synagogue setting. But Luke tells us a few other things. And he rose and stood there, and Jesus said to him, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? And after looking around, he said to them, stretch out your hand. And as he did so, his hand was restored. They were filled with fury and disgust with one another what they might do to Jesus. So this tells us uh, a little bit different argument. Here, Jesus is cited as having a different argument than he did in Matthew. Here in Luke, he's, uh, Jesus just kind of offers a more general argument. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or to harm, to save life, or destroy it? And it's asked as an interrogative question, wherein, in Matthew, he uses the sheep example, right? You pull a sheep out of a pit. And then he just says, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. He answers the question that he presents in Luke, right? Now, this is not conflicting information. This is uh, Jesus' is teaching, right? There's a whole, you know, you, you start almost cry a little bit inside when you think of all the text of stuff that Jesus said that we don't have today. But uh, Jesus was in the midst of teaching in the synagogue, and here are the bits and recollections of these various inspired apostles as they recorded them down for their various audiences. And so Jesus said all of these things in response. And so he uses a much more general argument here, and then I want to look at the the last reference here, which is Mark 3, verse 1. Mark 3, 1. And you probably know this because, uh, or you might be familiar with this, because when we looked at the grain uh, issue, the eating of the heads of the grain is the very end of Mark 2. So Mark actually keeps the chronology here. Immediately in Mark 3, We had the synagogue, and he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. So there's your wolves lying in wait, and he says to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. So this tells us something interesting. Matthew is alone in his sheep example. Here, Matthew was the only one who recalled and recorded the specific logical reasoning example that Jesus used against the Pharisees here by recording, uh, by showing them a specific emergence example. But they were silent. But Mark is usually much more brief, isn't he? Mark is typically not nearly as detailed as Matthew or Luke, but Mark includes a fascinating detail here that really keys us into what's going on. But they were silent, and he looked around them at, with anger and was grieved at their hardness of heart. And he said to them, and he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. And then the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. This is interesting because here Mark tells us why Jesus heals on the Sabbath. Right? He gives specific 
emotional reactions that Jesus is having. He's angry and he is grieved. And thus, he chooses to confront the self-righteousness and the legalism of the Pharisees. Now, neither Matthew or Luke records that. That the reason that Jesus does this is because he is angry enough and he is grieved enough at the self-righteous and unrepentant nature of these Pharisees that here and now he is going to demonstrate to them what mercy looks like firsthand. So, we kind of piece these together, these cross-references across the Gospels, and we see a larger picture forming, right, of what's really transpiring in this synagogue. And uh, I know there's some minor differences, and we can get into some of the, the little changes here and there. Mark, interestingly, notes that the Pharisees went out and counseled alongside the Herodians to destroy Jesus, which is an interesting side note that uh, the, Her- the, the members of Herod's council were also already looking for ways to get rid of Jesus. But regardless of the, such details, there are three major aspects when we piece all these together that we can see form our larger picture. And one is the setting, obviously the context, the background. He goes to this synagogue where he knows there's opponents and he knows there's these particular Pharisees that want to hit him on a technicality. And he goes to here and he starts teaching. And then we see also the context of his argument against them, right? Their argument's pretty ubiquitous across all three stories. They have the same argument. You can't heal on the Sabbath, right? We know that's their end goal. That's their ultimate argument. You shouldn't be allowed to heal on the Sabbath. Now, they're posing it as a question, but we know that's ultimately the catch-22 they're trying to catch Jesus in. Is saying, well, this is work. You're not allowed to do that on the Sabbath. The second thing is the argument that Jesus uses, which Mark and Luke kind of summarize in more general terms, but Matthew here cites a specific argument. And then finally, three which is the outcome for which I am relying heavily on Mark to show not only the motivation and the drive and the reason behind this passage, which is an anger and a grief that eventually leads to to a demonstration of mercy to someone who needs it. But the obvious other major fixture, and really the major fixture of this entire passage, is the man with the withered hand. And if you look this up in Greek, you do uh, syntax on this, and you do some vocabulary on this. You're not going to find a whole lot. Uh, this is kind of singular in its usage here. This is the only time. This Greek word is pretty straightforward. Uh, a dried up hand. It's withered. It's dried up. That's what it means, like a raisin, like something that's just withered away. It's actually a word. An arid hand is actually another description here. It's like this is a term in Greek that's used to describe like an arid climate, like a desert. It's dry out there. It's arid. There's no moisture. There's, there's no water out there. It's all dried up. That's really the most literal translation of this man's predicament that we know of. Uh, so based on that, we don't have a great deal of information. It could be any number of things. Uh, whatever the case is, probably the safest bet is to assume that something happened to this man, either some kind of uh, birth defect or deformity that he was born with at birth or some kind of later paralysis that somehow affected his arm tissue that uh, the muscles wore away from his arm. The muscle tissue was just withered up in some way. And we don't know, you know, that's beyond my scope of expertise is how that medically would work. But uh, somehow the muscles in his arm dried up to the extent where he can't extend his arm. He can't use those muscles anymore. Thus, the miracle in verse 13 is to stretch out the hand, right? Something that was otherwise would have been miraculous to do because the muscle doesn't work here. The tendon can't pull anything. There's nothing to pull. It's all dried up somehow. So that's the most likely scenario that we're dealing with here, although uh, uh, all we really have to go off of is that it was dry. The arm was dried up. It was withered away and dried up like a desert in some way. It was uh, non-functional. And also, bear in mind, uh, not only how difficult that would be physically, obviously that would be incredibly difficult to, to live with and is to this day, But uh, imagine living that way in a world where 95% of the world is most definitely either agricultural or uh, they're farmers or they're craftsmen. They use their hands all the time, right? If you're very lucky, you get to be a scribe or a Pharisee. But even then, you got to write with something. And uh, you got to use your hands. I mean, obviously, it's crippling to this day. But imagine living in a society where hard labor is the way of the day. Right? Everybody works hard. There's no cars, there's no air conditioning, there's 
you carry stuff from one hot house to the other, and you move your goods, you move your craft, you farm your farm, you take care of your livestock, and you have to have arms, and you've got to have hands to do that. Uh, and that's why it's such an interesting fact feature, and we see this all through the Gospels, where the poor are often uh, the group of poor and the group of those who are crippled and blind and, and otherwise maimed are often a very mutually inclusive circle, right? Because if you can't provide for yourself, because you can't work, you can't do things, your only option really is to beg. So this man would not just be, have a physical uh, problem, obviously, a very great physical uh, uh, disability, but also is materially and financially, unless he's taken in by some very generous family or he has family that's going to take care of him free of charge and just provide for him, his options are beg or be poor, right? Uh, or it's not great. He's not going to do well. So you can imagine you would already, and you've probably already even now, have some sympathy for this guy, right? Uh, if you could rectify his situation, regardless of his spiritual state, just as a general show of mercy and grace, you would probably do so, hypothetically speaking, right? Let's assume you had the power to, to, to fix withered hands instantaneously. Uh, would you not want to just help this guy just as a general sense of mercy, even if you're not interested in necessarily uh, uh, preaching the gospel to him at this direct moment? Let's assume whether or you're not, you would just want to help somebody in this kind of need who can't take care of themselves, who, who uh, not only experiences the difficulty of being paralyzed in this way, but also as very light, his, his outlook is not good uh, for taking care of himself for the rest of his life. So then imagine if just, even if your general mercies have been stirred for this man at this point, imagine now how hard and how calloused you must be to be a Pharisee who not only is not interested in healing this man if given the opportunity, but is actually going to use him as a political pawn against Jesus if necessary. Right? Which is exactly what they're doing here. They're going to use this man who has this crippling condition, who is struggling already, not even interested in healing him. They're interested in using him as a pawn again to their play. This is a level of unprecedented self-righteousness and evil that Jesus is rightly angry with and grieved over how hard their heart is per Mark 3. And so we see their question, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And there's, a, again, it's almost ridiculous, you know, at the, uh, at the end of the day. You think about this question for more than five minutes and you'll realize how ridiculous such a question is. But, like we just looked at in verses 1 through 8, they are full of ridiculous questions and uh, uh, full of ridiculous questions such as, are you allowed to pick up something with your right or left hand on the Sabbath day or even pull these grain heads off of this stock of grain and eat it if you're hungry on the Sabbath day? And this word is very specific in, uh, in verse 12 or sorry, in Matthew, it's verse 10, so that they might accuse him, right? All three gospel writers very much indicate this was obviously for a reason. No one's in, truly interested in Sabbath law here. They're just interested in using the withered man uh, as a political pawn in their game so they can accuse Christ. And that Greek word is very clear, to accuse, to act as a plaintiff, to bring a charge against someone. It is interesting because uh, its cognate word, uh, satanas, is the accuser. Or, uh, as you can probably are familiar with, uh, the word for satanas is an accusing one. You give Satan a, uh, a little bit of a role, right? He is the accusing one. He's the plaintiff on Judgment Day. This is the same kind of, that's a cognate word of what's used here. An accuser, someone who brings a charge or interested in creating some kind of uh, charge against somebody. <clears throat> and hopefully we already see kind of how ridiculous this is. You would imagine that Already this should be a question that is already answered. How ridiculous it must be to be allowed to demonstrate mercy on the Sabbath day to heal. And make no mistake, I mean, this should go without saying, Jesus is not working by healing, per se, on the Sabbath day, right? It would be, you might even be able to make a hypothetical argument if he was healing them and putting in work like a doctor does, like actually laying out an arm on the table and having to operate on it. That might be work. Jesus can snap his fingers and it's healed. No effort. He is God, right? Atoms are forced to obey him. The material molecules around him are required and constrained to obey. If he commands, 
He made them, right? So uh, it's not as though Jesus is somehow uh, like God on the seventh day of creation, doesn't have to exercise some great amount of effort and of his infinitude to bring about creation or to heal this man's arm. This is clearly just another ridiculous claim by these Pharisees. And I know uh, I've written off a lot of stuff that's overly ridiculous in the last couple of weeks, but I do want to remind us also that we are still to this day surrounded by a great deal of ridiculousness that is not unlike these cold-hearted and calloused Pharisees that are caught on this super technicality. And the one that, uh, I mean, you think even today in 2021 AD, how ridiculously over-technical and self-righteous people have become over any number of issues that I'm sure you can bring to mind. The one that came to my mind immediately was using of, I mean, you know, we, we, obviously we believe, disbelieve in this regardless, but uh, the use of pronouns, right? Have you ever been dealt with somebody who's come at you and they're more righteous than you because they use the correct pronoun to address a specific him, her, person, whatever. And uh, the whole understanding of that is that they are more correct than you. They are more self-righteous than you are. Uh, here are they, the true knights of virtue, uh, by demonstrating what is the correct word to use in a sentence. Even if you were to hypothetically agree with them that that is the correct way to treat somebody, um, you know, such a ridiculous level of righteousness to the point at which what you say in a specific sentence derives how much more righteous you are than you <laughs> is uh, the kind of technicality that the Pharisees are dealing with here. And uh, we see it all around us today. How many times have you been addressed by someone in a more, let's say, woke camp than yourself and been shown how uh, much more righteous uh, they are than you in any number of variety of ways? And that's the whole understanding of it, right, is that they're here to demonstrate how righteous they are instead of you. That's exactly the same human problem in 30 AD in the middle of a Judaistic society. Same exact humans, same exact sin. So, Jesus responds with his own statement. And he interestingly here, in Matthew, this is the only recording we have of this kind of uh, metaphorical example that he gives, the sheep example, right? This is not cited in Mark or Luke. Which of you having a sheep, should it fall into a pit on the Sabbath, not go and pull it out? And Matthew alone uses this example, and uh, uh, it's obviously to be explained by the answer that he himself answers in Matthew answers his own question. Luke and Mark uh, just leave it as, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? Period. Generically. And the answer is implied. Obviously it is. Matthew openly answers, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Period. <laughs> right? Indicatively. He just says up front, he answers the correct question that Luke, Mark and Luke present. And obviously this is an example of doing good on the Sabbath that he cites in verse 12 to pull this sheep out of a pit. Now, we can get into any number of reasons why this is, um, just on a personal level. Why was it that you would pull a sheep out of a pit on the Sabbath day, even if you're running the risk of offending the Sabbath in some way? Let's assume hypothetically, even if that was the case, even if you were risking breaking the Sabbath, which uh, you are not, if you understand the purpose of it correctly. But assume for a moment that you're a Jew in 0 AD, and you don't know that, and uh, you're probably, your sheep fell in a pit. What's your first inclination? Well, first, it's probably just one at a personal mercy, right? That's your sheep. That's an, even if you're not attached to the animal personally or emotionally, if it's not a pet of any type, it's probably a very valuable piece of livestock, right? So it could be a personal thing. It could be an emotional thing. You won't want your pet sheep to die in a pit on the Sabbath day and remain there. <clears throat> but uh, and this is something that sheep especially were notorious for. I can't remember. I was watching it. I think I was watching a YouTube video a couple weeks ago of a sheep, and you know, I know I've talked about, we talked about in the Sermon on the Mount why sheep are notoriously not brilliant. And uh, you see videos, they get flopped on their backs, and they can't get up. They get stuck on their back, you've got to go out there and actually flip them over. They're not smart enough to figure out how to roll over, and they can't because they're so heavy. And I saw a video of a sheep, and he jumps in a hole in his ditch, and these, I think it's like Scottish sheep farmers come out, and they pull him out of the hole. And what's the first thing the sheep does is he panics, he jumps in the next hole right next to that hole, and they had to go pull them out again. He's just, they're not brilliant animals. And in a day and age like 30 AD, in Israel, where uh, you don't have tractors and cranes and pulleys, right? You've got to get down in that pit and pull the sheep out with your hands. And even if you're not attached to this animal, 
It's probably your livestock and it's your livelihood and it's your financial means of support, or at least one of them, one of many. But uh, no man in his right mind is just going to let his livelihood be washed down the drain if he can get down in the pit and pull it out on the Sabbath. Now, as you can already imagine, however, already the, uh, now this is nowhere will you find in Scripture or in the Mosaic Law that there are laws about pulling animals out of a ditch on the Sabbath. Now, there are laws about pulling animals out of ditches and how you should go about it, and specifically laws about if, if your animal falls into your neighbor's ditch, it's his fault. And, uh, or if your animal wanders onto certain people's properties, and uh, there's laws about if other animals fall into other people's ditches, and if your animal dies in someone else's pit, how they're going to divide up the meat and stuff like that. But there's not a specific law about animals falling into pits on the Sabbath day in the law of Moses. But, as you can imagine, for about 1,500 years, they've had time to work on that. And uh, there has already been some attempts at creating these codes and these laws, and you can find some of these in the Midrash and the Talmud and other extra-biblical Jewish literature from B.C. era. And John Gill actually cites this one. John Gill is an old Puritan commentator, and he says, In the Talmud it says, If a beast should fall into a ditch or a pool of water, if it can be given food where it is, leave it there until the going out of the Sabbath. But if not... You may bring bolsters and pillows to it and put under it, and if it will come out willingly, it will then come out. So apparently, the law that already had been semi-instituted by various priests and, uh, and, uh, and Pharisees and stuff like that was, well, he's got to stay in the pit for the rest of the Sabbath until, Monday, or until Saturday night, but uh, what you can do is you can bring him food. You can dump some food in the hole. You can dump some water in the hole, or you can try and throw some like pillows and stuff in the hole and see if he can figure out how to climb out on his own. And if he does that, that's fine. But you can't get down in the pit and pull him out yourself. Now, it should be noted that these were kind of debated. This was not fully enforced. This was not something that was absolute law of the land across Israel. And as we saw even last week, there were different sects of Pharisees and different levels of the Essenes and the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and they themselves argued amongst themselves about what was Sabbath and what was not Sabbath. So this was not a universal code for all of Judea, but this is one example of where they tried to institute something like that, where they tried to bring about this regulation of what you're going to do in an emergency animal problem on the Sabbath day. Uh, John Gill says, in, one where, in another location in the Talmud, it's written differently. If a beast falls into a ditch, it is forbidden for a man to bring it out with his hand. But if you can give it food where it is, it may be fed until the going out of the Sabbath. You know, and you can probably already, using your simple logic skills here, see how that's kind of a contradiction of terms. Why am I going to carry food to it, but not pick it up, right? Or why am I going to uh, take the time and effort to drag out pillows and scaffolding and stuff and throw that in the pit so the sheep can get out, but not get down there and pick it up, right? It's already illogical. But whether or not this law was expressly mandated or made clear, very few people at this time, especially your average farmer or sheep farmer or uh, animal husbandman, was going to be foolish enough, no matter what the law said or what the Pharisees or the rabbis or the lawyers were saying, to let a good piece of his livestock die in a pit on the Sabbath day. Now, just for reference, you don't have to, this is more of a side note, you don't have to look this up, but if you also look over at Luke 14, 1 through 5, you'll find... Not the hand, but you'll find an example of where Luke actually uses the sheep example. Just bear that in mind. He uses the same exact sheep analogy for a different case in Luke 14, 1 through 5. But regardless of that, Jesus' point still makes, is pretty clear, right? That even the Pharisees relented that some things clearly took precedence over strict Sabbath observance, such as general doing good and caring, right? In this case, caring for the sheep and also secondarily or primarily for your livelihood if it was in danger on the Sabbath day. Calvin puts it this way. John Calvin has a great section and uh, as usual, he, has, he, throws no, he pulls no punches. He says, he who takes away the life of a man would be held to be a criminal and there's little difference between manslaughter and the conduct of him who does not concern himself about relieving a person in distress. 
So then, Christ charges them with endeavoring under the pretense of holiness to compel him to do evil by allowing this man to not be healed. For if that sin is committed, as we have already said, not only by him who does anything contrary to the law, but also by him who neglects his duty. What he means by that is that apathy is not sinless, right? One cannot do nothing and be without sin. And so when here is a real example of a man who is in dire need, who is in distress, who needs, it has the opportunity here for miraculous, life-changing help. And to withhold that from him as a Pharisee here is no different, Calvin says, than if they had damaged his hand themselves. He holds that to be the same moral, logical principle here. And so Christ is illustrating here how showing compassion and helping on the Sabbath day obviously trumps the technicality of Sabbath law. Now, the general principle, we understand the Sabbath a little more correctly perhaps these days, and uh, the general principle that we understand from this is that God, in AD 2021, regardless of Sabbath, of Jew, uh, Jewish, Gentile, Sabbath observance, whatever, God expects all of us to act and do good and show compassion regardless of whatever self-righteousness, cultural or fabricated morality, or man-made laws may get in the way. You will be expected, and it is your duty and requirement to do so, regardless of fabricated morality, regardless of man-made laws, regardless of man-made cultural assumptions, and most definitely, regardless of our own personal levels of self-righteousness or sinful inclinations, i.e., as these Pharisees demonstrate. Now, I know there are some, and there, uh, there's those that might make an argument, or some that in certain commentaries make an argument, that unless you could make an argument that doing so violates Scripture, which I don't believe you can ever make an argument that somehow uh, not helping or not aiding or not showing general, even just a general compassion to humanity, unless it was in a very specific case, was somehow a violation of Scripture, that otherwise doing general good and caring for fellow man and most especially specific good, which I would argue is the furtherment and advancement of the gospel in the kingdom of Christ, right? And the preaching of the gospel and the furtherment of the kingdom of God. It takes precedence over whatever man-made fabricated morality may surround it. And most definitely, as we see here in this particular text, that Christ himself is angry and openly grieved, not really necessarily over the man-made morality here, but specifically over the hardness of the self-righteousness that has encased these people so much that they are not willing to genuinely help a man live. Which is absurd, right? And unfortunately, that is the case with a great deal of many human beings. And unfortunately, even saved believers in Christ have a tendency to have hard hearts, as we know and as we're familiar with. And that uh, we don't have to think for too long about thinking about situations and places where we can also demonstrate coldness. And this is something that should not be, my brothers, as James says. And furthermore, it is something that Christ here condemns and says it is the duty and the uh, necessary function of Christ and also his disciples and those who wish to emulate Christ to show mercy and to show compassion and to show grace and to show kindness over and against whatever self-righteousness or legalism we may have created for our own sinful hearts or whatever may be even inflicted upon us by fabricated, man-made society at large. Christ still expects this of us. Now, you don't have the power to go out and miraculously heal a man's hand, unless you know something I don't. But uh, we do have the power to not only demonstrate general good, but also specific good. And I should be more clear there, because Christ does make it very clear in verse 12, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. You say, okay, what is that? What is good, generically? You could ask Plato and Socrates and get all kinds of ethereal answers, and even Augustine plays around with Platonic philosophy a little bit to that extent, to an extent, not a great deal. I do love Augustine. But there are specific definitions of good in Scripture 
This word is agathos, to do good. It is lawful to do good. And uh, it's used hundreds of times. It's used a great deal across scripture, as you can imagine. It's a very generic word. Um, it can just mean something is generically good. A ship is good. Uh, a road is good. Um, a boot is good. It can just mean something's acceptable of quality. Or it can be morally good, such as is used here, right? It is lawful to do, as a noun, good. Being a noun idea, being a central idea. What is good, ethereally speaking? Well, we know it's not ethereal, for one. Firstly, the best definition we could offer is good is defined as a person, right? As God, as uh, God the Father, and especially as Christ, right? The nature and the person of God is intrinsically good. And it is by far the best definition of goodness that we will ever have for eternity, right? So, we could translate this any number of ways, but one of the best ways that we could look at this theologically speaking as an interpretation is what do you mean if you want to know what it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath? It is lawful to be Christ-like on the Sabbath. It is lawful to be God-like on the Sabbath in that we emulate his character, Right? Which includes, interestingly, on the Sabbath, uh, his rage and his grief towards hard-heartedness <laughs> of specific people in his midst at this moment, on the Sabbath day, right? To these people, it includes genuine compassion and mercy and care for this individual who is in dire need and has a need that Christ can meet instantaneously, miraculously, right? And show general grace. And most definitely, good also includes the preaching of the gospel and the spreading of eternal good, right? The saving of souls and the edifying of souls on the Sabbath day. That's good. And there's any number of goods that are described throughout the rest of uh, Scripture, Old Testament and New, that emulate the character of God and how we are supposed to act in regards to his will. You could also uh, argue this another way. It is lawful to do the will of God on the Sabbath. That should be pretty, right, pretty simple. Should be pretty well known and understood. What God wills and what God commands us to do, we should do regardless of what other men say about us, what other men determine is the Sabbath day, what other men determine is the fabricated morality of the day and age, what other men determine is their own self-righteous standard of what you should do, regardless of those things outwardly, and most definitely regardless of our own cold hearts and our hard-heartedness, which very much can arise on many occasions, as I know many of us are familiar with, you're still called to do the will of God. So, there's still a great deal we can draw from this particular passage. And we know the ending of the story is pretty straightforward. Verse 13, Christ says, Stretch out your hand, which is in and of itself supposed to be the miraculous statement. Right? The specific text is recorded, Stretch out your hand, uh, by all three of these gospel writers, he stretches it out. Yeah, that's the miracle, is that it was unstretchable before. And the text even says in Matthew, it was restored healthy like the other. So this is 100% restoration right here, full recovery. As uh, Christ has demonstrated, he has this full power. But as we know, I'm wrapping up here, in verse 14, the hard-heartedness of the Pharisees is unmoved, right? They're still... Uh, against Christ. They are still convinced that he is the problem, even in the face of this mercy and this compassion shown this man and whose life has just been changed for the better. They're still not interested. And in fact, if anything, they actually become harder <laughs> because it is fascinating. This is the first time in Matthew that we actually see, now the, he's run into the Pharisees before, he's dealt with them on a couple of different occasions, but this is the first time we see the Pharisees actually begin their conspiracy. For the first time, it says they're conspiracing how to apollo me, how to destroy him in verse 14. That's the first time that appears. This is the first time the Pharisees are now decided they're going to rally together and hurt him permanently. They're going to put him out of the picture. They're going to kill him in some way. It's the first time this appears. So not only is that uh, uh, now they've dealt with him and he, they've kind of uh, put him off before, but now they're not going to put him off anymore going to handle him directly according to their sinful methods. And obviously we're going to see how that progresses as Matthew goes on and as their conspiracy gets darker and worse and bigger and as they finally come and bring it to fruition. 
but it does set the tone for the next few chapters that are coming as we see the beginning of a people that are so lost in their own sin and self-righteous malice that they prefer to kill this compassionate uh, God who is man and man who is God rather than repent of their ways and turn of their sin. So, this passage is clearly designed for a couple different purposes in closing. You can see here that all of Matthew 12, especially up to this point, has really been written to a very Jewish audience. You can probably detect that by the amount of time Matthew dedicates to the Sabbath, right? And interpreting it and interpreting it rightly in Jesus' various confrontations with it. And uh, it is very clear that Matthew means to also write this extensively to a book of Jewish people who need to have the understanding that Christ had of the Sabbath and uh, need to be, uh, have this preached to them in this kind of condemnation of the Jewish self-righteous morality that has taken over God's purpose and command in this day and age. But uh, we can still draw real principles from this in A.D. 2021. And uh, we can see here the, uh, the real mission and the purpose of Christ over the fact that he fulfills the Sabbath, and he is the Sabbath, right? And it is very much the will of God to bring about compassion and his kingdom, regardless of what other men may think about it. So there's two things that I want to leave with. Today. And the first is that mercy and compassion should be key important aspects of the life of those who are Christ's disciples, most definitely more so than observing any technicalities offered to us. Every disciple of Christ should make these aspects paramount in their life and ministry to those around them, and definitely more so than any fabricated reasons, whether they be internal or external problems that we can come up with. And then finally, the second thing we can take from this passage is the unwillingness of unregenerate, sinful man to accept this truth. Right? The Pharisees are still unmoved. This, uh, if nothing else, should highlight to us the incredible need for the grace of God and the Holy Spirit and regeneration to change human hearts because mercy is just completely lost on these people. Right? Genuine compassion is just so far gone from these people. They don't even have the understanding of how to help this man anymore. Just use him in their pawn game. And uh, really that should, in many ways, sober us up to the reality of sin and how serious and how destructive and how absolutely devastating it will be to your spirit and soul, but also our state of mind without Christ, right? And who we were without the gospel of Christ and the spirit of Christ to regenerate us and to teach us things like grace and compassion. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for regenerating our hearts, for making us new people, for giving us hearts of flesh that are designed to emulate your compassion and example your goodness. And I thank you for this, and I praise you for making us a people that want to be disciples and not Pharisees. And Lord, it is only your spirit in us, working through us constantly, that makes us good and compels us to act like you. And so I pray that that would be the case with us that we would be a merciful people, we'd be a compassionate people, we'd be a people who desire to bring about your kingdom, who desire to bring about your gospel, who desire to bring about repentance and faith in the life of believers and unbelievers alike, and to genuinely build up the saints. And I pray, Lord, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit on a constant basis, that we would live this way like your Son, and that you would make us this way as we know you will, and perfect it into eternity. We pray this in Christ's most holy name. Amen. Please stand.